It's the first day after last week's fireworks, and the markets are looking for direction. That's if you look at equities, of course, but if you look elsewhere, the fireworks continue. That's what we're going to check out here as we get started for the week. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And what we are going to do here is take a look at what the markets did. Of course, uh, last week, it should be no surprise that the U.S. election held sway as far as reasons for things to make moves. But we'll take a look at what that's uh, ended up giving us and what perhaps it might mean. Uh, and then uh, we'll take a look at what is on the menu for this week and see how that might influence things going forward. So let's take a look uh, here first at uh, what we are uh, getting here from the upshot of what, what last week told us and uh, go through this performance. I mean, clearly uh, on the equity side, there's no question that there was a massive one-day move last week. Most of what happened thereafter was much slower by comparison, and most of what happened before was standstill. And that was, of course, the outcome of the U.S. election. Strong rallies for the S&P and the NASDAQ, uh, up, give or take, 5% apiece. Uh, and the upshot from the bond market, interesting, uh, giving us not so much a uniform upswell in yields, although that was the initial reaction once the election outcome became clear, but more a steepening of the yield curve. So yields rising at the front end, up 1% on the two-year, backing away a little bit on the long end, down 1.8% at the 10-year. Now, Obviously, looking at the 10-year after a 3.4% rise, a 1.8% pullback still leaves you net with higher rates. But interesting to see that what we got last week was a kind of pulling of uh, the rate structure forward, a sense that rates are going to be higher nearer term, which in some ways lines up with what the implications of the uh, election seem to mean, and that is, of course, something that's been in the market for weeks and months ahead when um, the former uh, president and uh, now third-time uh, contestant, second-time president-elect Donald Trump uh, would be leading in the run-up to this election. The sort of policy mix, broadly speaking, tended to be negative for bonds, tended to be positive for the U.S. dollar, tended to uplift yields because the upshot tended to be that this would be inflationary, that the introduction of tariffs would be inflationary, that significant um, efforts to stem uh, migrant flows and to, uh, on a large scale, remove migrants from the country, that this would be inflationary. Uh, and that, of course, meant that the Fed probably had less scope to cut rates. It probably meant that the dollar had more of a yield advantage uh, than if those things were not the likely trajectory of policy. Uh, and so uh, you had a similar sort of response once uh, Donald Trump actually secured victory with last week's election. And the mix of uh, responses seemed to be, well, deregulation, tax cuts, especially corporate tax uh, cuts, are likely to unleash some degree of animal spirits, some degree of fiscal stimulus by way of, uh, by way of uh, tax reduction uh, into the economy, so stocks go higher. You also have that in addition to tariffs. Well, I mean, of course, the pickup in economic growth is inflationary already. But that then is coupled with the prospect of widespread tariffs and a significant disruption to labor supply. That then is inflationary. And so you get this tilting toward higher rates 
in the near term. Gold, interestingly, falls against this uh, environment, seemingly recoupling uh, with its relationship uh, with the dollar and yield. So when yields in the dollar go up, the gold tends to decline in that it yields nothing and uh, is a natural foil for fiat currencies. It, 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 it had an interesting decoupling from that, which we'll take a look at uh, momentarily. The election seems to have taken that decoupling and closed it. The dollar higher, we can see a 1.2% gain on the euro. And the idea that this administration will be friendlier to the crypto industry delivering a massive upswell for Bitcoin, it rises almost 11%. Since then, an interesting thing has transpired. So stock markets today idling, not really going uh, very far at all. Uh, if we look at the S&P uh, here, it manages a very modest increase uh, here on uh, the day, but is basically flat. Uh, if we look at what's going on with the NASDAQ, it is flat, but a little bit lower on the day, down about uh, 0.3%, uh, whereas the uh, S&P is very narrowly, uh, very narrowly higher. Uh, and uh, what you end up with then is uh, a situation where there's waiting that's happening uh, as if to say, here is your baseline views of risk appetite in the markets, S&P 500 sort of chief among them, and it has a net daily increase of 0.05%. In other words, whatever the strength of the move last week, now we've kind of paused for consideration. By contrast, NASDAQ ends up down 0.1% on the close. Again, a little bit soggy and a little bit in the other uh, direction, but nevertheless, very little changed. And so there seems to be a kind of settling of the dust and a look ahead into what may be the next shoe to drop. And that story begins with U.S. CPI data. The expectation here is that we're going to have uh, the core level, the one that the Fed tends to look at most closely because it most closely follows those things that the Fed can actually influence underlying demand uh, in the economy. It's not much the Fed can do about global energy or global food costs. We have uh, the expectation that 3.3% holds for a second consecutive month. In other words, if we uh, consider what U.S. inflation is doing here in this context, this would be uh, the second month at 33 after September. That was a rise to 3 Point, uh, or from 3.2 in August, the low in the sequence, as a matter of fact, is 3.2 in July. So June is the last time that we were at 3.3. We took a step lower. July was a meaningful low. And since July, so what will be the fourth month for October, if the expectations hold, we will have stopped making progress on core inflation. And that, of course, is an issue here. The expectation, of course, that the headline will also move higher from 2.4 to 2.6. That would be the highest since uh, July, so a three-month high uh, if it comes out as expected. But it's really the core that is the main issue. We can see that uh, when we uh, see what makes for this gap in between core and and headline it's this stuff down here it's the ebbing negative contribution to cpi from goods and of course from energy 
at least in the case of goods, it seems to be rebasing back to zero over the coming months. So perhaps in this incoming data, we'll have that influence rebased out, and uh, that'll give us this pop in the headline. But from the Fed's perspective, this massive area in core services is where inflation lives, and that's approximated by this core CPI uh, reading, which isn't going their way at this point. It's certainly not uh, materially running away from them, but it is certainly not making the kind of progress they would like to see. Later in the week, we're going to get uh, retail sales numbers. Expectation here is that we're going to get a rise of 0.3%. That's after 0.7% in the prior month. Give us a sense of what the economy is doing in what is the most important part of the landscape. And that's, of course, because 80% almost, 75 to 80% uh, of GDP in any given quarter is contributed by household consumption. And so how retail sales uh, work out here, what uh, appetite is uh, for uptake and whether receipts stay within this range or start to veer off, that's a very, very important consideration for how the overall economy is doing. The explosive strength in service sector ISM numbers would suggest that there's perhaps some upside surprise risk here. And indeed, if we look at the way U.S. economic data has tended to perform, Relative to forecast, we can see increasingly since late August, U.S. economic data has overshot estimates. And not only has it overshot, not only is this uh, Citigroup index above its zero line that separates upside surprise tendency with downside surprise tendency, the quotient by which we've surprised, the momentum in upside surprises, has been building and building in a steep, steep way, suggesting that we are still in a place where U.S. economic data has momentum much greater than the baseline expectations from economists' models are implying. And so the risk is that we continue to surprise higher, both on the retail sales number here and the CPI report. And of course, what all of this distills into is a still less hawkish, or a still less dovish, uh, rather, uh, outlook on U.S. monetary policy. We can see that here already. Here is where the peak in rate cut speculation is. This is right on the eve of the Fed's 50 basis point cut in mid-September. Here is that cut. And what we can see is, as the data has been getting better, this is it right here, so to scope for rate cuts next year has diminished. Now, we can see for this year, we've been basically fairly steady. The cut that we just saw was expected, and indeed, uh, we've now uh, had that happen uh, last week. And what we are still looking for at this point is the possibility that there is another one in December, but we can see those odds aren't moving very much. The key question, of course, now, whether we are going to get something like a move in uh, the final meeting of the year, 65% chance that that move is going to happen. And then looking at next year, at this point, the market is tilting to maybe two more cuts next year. So two of them are, are baked in, but obviously 58 basis points is a far cry uh, from what would be there were we to get the full three cuts. But that would be 75 basis points, which means we're only eight basis points on the way to pricing that in, giving three cuts a mere 32% uh, chance of happening. So at least as far as what's baked in now. If we continue to get movement in this direction, if the data keeps getting hotter, that means higher yields. And when we look at what this means, we can see 
here was the move in the long end of the curve following the election. We've since corrected almost all the way back, and we're still sitting right at these lows that we sort of begrudgingly took out going into last week's vote. If the data on the U.S. side continues to surprise higher, the expectation ostensibly will be that rates will be higher downwind because the Fed will be still less able to cut rates in what is uh, shaping up to be an increasingly inflationary environment before we even consider what's going on with the way fiscal policy will change under a new Trump administration. And so with that in mind, there is perhaps risk that this continues to move lower on those numbers. And of course, if the numbers go the other way, the interesting thing would be if this is in fact an attempt at bottoming. And that perhaps requires a, a push back over 119 somewhere into here to sort of reset this series of lower lows and lower highs. The, the other big question here uh, within the same narrative is gold, which of course hasn't waited and is uh, aggressively moving lower already, taking out its up move since back mid-year, where the market really started to speculate on more Fed easing. We can, of course, see that right here. This is mid-year. We only expect three cuts at this point. As we start to expect more, gold understandably moves up. It has now basically erased all of its divergence uh, from what's been happening in bonds after the Fed, but before the election. We can see here, here's the Fed meeting. This is where the Fed cuts 50 basis points and promises more cuts, and the market goes, ah, you're cutting in a hot economy. Rates go higher. Bonds go lower. Incidentally, you see the same thing in the, the U.S. dollar. The Fed is right here. As rates go higher, so too does the dollar. This is the euro sinking here uh, as the dollar strengthens. But gold, interestingly, decoupled from that here. Well, now in the aftermath of the election, that's the election here, and this is today, we've erased that divergence. And the question then be becomes, if you now get hot U.S. economic data, do you continue to build lower because gold now is a function of the underlying dynamics as it typically is after an aberrant period. So if you take out 2618, then you open the way down lower into this area. And of course, then the line in the sand on the top side, assuming things go the other way, comes in right here, 27 uh, and into about 2722 to 2730. This is the chart of the dollar that we just looked at a moment ago, the greenback continues to push higher, progress still getting made. We're looking at now this low from uh, earlier in the year at 106.29 as the bogey. And if we do get hotter U.S. economic data and that does give us higher yield, the expectation would be that that continues to echo here, which means that if we then take out this level, we open the way down in the direction of 105, sub 106 and into 105. And one might expect that that extends into other dimensions of the dollar also. But there, and in particular uh, in the UK and in Australia, there is some data of their own to shape outcomes. Uh, in the UK, we have the uh, third quarter GDP result, the expectation that we are going to see a further strengthening of the economy. It's really tried to build momentum this year. We can see we started the first quarter with a contraction and really sat near standstill for much of 2022 and 2023. We're seemingly starting to see things heat up a little. And the expectation is that for the third quarter, we're going to get a 1% rise uh, in, in GDP, which would be the strongest, uh, clearly, in quite some time. We'd have to go back to early 2022 to see comparable numbers. So here, things are, to some extent, the mirror image of what's going on in the U.S., where 
while U.S. data has been surprising on the upside, U.K. data is increasingly surprising on the downside. And if this GDP number comes out and gives us a softer outcome, that's likely to reinforce speculation that the Bank of England is going to be more willing to cut rates. We already saw with the Bank of England policy announcement last week a smaller consensus uh, deviation, as it were. The expectation was that two of the nine voters uh, on, the, on the committee would vote to forestall r rate cuts, and it fell to one. And certainly nobody wanted to hike. Uh, the consensus around easing, in, by contrast, that seems to be strengthening and weaker than expected CPI numbers out of the most recent UK uh, figures. Those don't help in that sense. So if you get a softer number on GDP, you might get the impetus for the pound to start looking more like the euro, catch up on the downside, uh, take out this support in uh, the sort of lower 128s area through about 129, this sort of congestion zone right here, and end up with a pathway down sub 127 into these levels. The top of this uh, range still uh, stubbornly holding it around 130, 130, 50. And then finally, out of China, industrial production and retail sales numbers do. Data out of China also is tended to underwhelm. Inflation numbers over the weekend were a case in point, and explosive export growth numbers last week looked more like front-running eventual tariffs and trying to get things in at lower cost rather than genuine demand. Uh, not surprisingly, the Australian dollar, a proxy for uh, Chinese e economic conditions, first jumped and then the following day erased all of it as it became clear that it probably was not a sign of robust export strength with legs that came out there. And then, of course, the inflation numbers over the weekend helped to confirm that the situation remains anemic. If these numbers miss, as Chinese data has tended, then we end up with perhaps the catalyst to finally take out this bottom on the Aussie and have it lock in uh, with something more similar to what we're seeing in the euro and set the stage for a move down sub 65. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and where things may go there from. Uh, I am uh, also on Futures Power Hour Mondays and Fridays. I am on The Price of Truth on Tuesday this week, uh, usually Wednesday, but we've shuffled things around a little bit. Uh, I am uh, also there for first call uh, with Tom and Victor on Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilya Spivak. If you are watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe. Macromoney will be back tomorrow. Happy trading.